the beauty of this project is that it not only gives you a broader aspect of Lexington's history, particularly African-American history, but also introduces you to individuals and situations that may not ever have crossed anyone's purview. Together Lexington was formed with the goal of trying to bring um, a sense of community pride and spirit um, to Lexington to talk about what we're proud of about Lexington and also to fund a series of projects uh, that would benefit the community and hopefully have a lasting impact. We held um, community conversations. We called them courageous conversations to talk about issues that need to be talked about but maybe aren't always so comfortable to talk about. One of the things that came out from our conversations on race um, were just issues that the community has um, from the Confederate statues that at the time were uh, in a place of prominence to um, really a lack of being able to tell the full story of Lexington. We wanted to make sure that we told um, the good and the bad uh, of Lexington's history so that people would get a full picture so that we could understand um, what happened in Lexington and, and how that still impacts us today and moving forward, how we can come together as a community by learning from, uh, from the past. It was an exciting project because it was one that we hadn't done one to this level or this extent. And then we pulled together a group of individuals, probably about 20 uh, noted historians, uh, people that had an interest, community activists in, in African American history. As a child, I never learned, I never knew what I have learned in my 20 years of research. And from that, I found that there were um, former enslaved individuals who moved into a period of enlightenment, growth, and progression. And to read about how they achieved that is just, it's just amazing, absolutely amazing. The individual that I promoted more than any other was Charlotte Dupuy. Charlotte was an enslaved woman to Henry and Lucretia Clay. She had been purchased by Henry Clay because she had formed a union with Aaron Dupuy, who was an individual that was enslaved to Henry Clay and was as his manservant. So Charlotte and Aaron became part of Henry Clay's household. And this was just as he was setting up the estate out Richmond Road. When Henry Clay was elected as Secretary of State nationally in 1825, he took Lottie and Aaron and their two children with them to Washington, D.C. 1829, when Clay is due to return to Kentucky, his term had ended, Charlotte decides, hey, I've been in Maryland. Maryland's a free state. I want my freedom. So she asked Henry Clay, and he did not grant her freedom. So her recourse was to file a suit in the district court, which she did. So the court decided that Charlotte needed to stay in Washington, D.C. while they were trying to sort out whether or not she had a legitimate case. And the court decided he was not legally responsible to free her. He tells Charlotte, you pay your way back home. Charlotte says, uh-uh, not doing that. So Henry Clay has her put in jail. It took him a while, but he found a friend to go and escort her back. Charlotte didn't spend a penny. <laughs> Charlotte finally made it back to Kentucky two years later. And where does she come? To Ashland. And that's where she stayed up until after the Civil War. There's so much history and, and so much of it's part of folklore and some of it's the actual history. Uh, how do you bring all that together and, and tell a story, a, a cohesive story in the community? We wanted to make it representative of the three different eras that we wanted to focus on, which would be enslavement, uh, the Jim Crow era, and then the black freedom struggle. We came up with 20 individuals or 20 occurrences in Lexington that we thought we could showcase, but because of finances, we had to whittle it down. So we got them down to 11. 
And then we wanted to make it walkable. There are a couple signs that we felt like were so important and such important issues that they stray a little bit outside of the core urban area, but we wanted to make sure that it was something that, that people could, could walk in a reasonable amount of time, you know, no matter what their uh, capability might be. We tried to find the actual sites where events had occurred or individuals had participated. A lot like the lunch counter sit-ins, the old department stores are no longer here, but uh, across the street you'll notice a, a sign that talks about the, the women's movement and the lunch counter sit-ins. So even though the structures aren't here, the events that took place uh, are, are still here. The stories of bravery and courage from people who risked and gave their lives so other people could have the opportunity to vote. To, um, you know, the Jacksons, just as a couple, how remarkable they were together and that they weren't just satisfied with creating their own success or their family's success, but they really leveraged that into community success. And then maybe um, one of my favorites is Mary Britton. Her mother and father were free blacks, lived here in Lexington, purchased a home in 1856 in Gratz Park. Just after emancipation, Henry and Laura moved their family to Berea so that their children can go to school there. Julia was the oldest child. She was a musical prodigy. And then Mary was the second oldest child. And she too was very talented. Unfortunately for she and the rest of her siblings, Henry died suddenly in 1874 and their mother died in June of 1874. So they ended up having to come back to Lexington. Mary becomes a teacher. About 1889, Mary decided that she wanted to become a physician. She went to Chicago and studied there at the college. She graduated in June 1902, comes back, and there are rules and laws, so she filed her license, filed to receive her license here in Lexington in August of 1902. In 1903, she builds her house that's still standing on North Limestone. That's where she practiced medicine. And she was not only medically inclined, but she's also very active socially. She was a social justice uh, activist. Women and children were her focus, but she was very eloquent. To see um, people who weren't famous, but they were extraordinary, and that their impact is still being felt today um, is pretty remarkable. Those individuals left us their stories, and it's up to us to tell them. Every tribe has a storyteller, and it's up to that storyteller to tell the story of those who've gone before.